this image, even though it's not a great photograph or you know it's not possibly significant from you know from artistic standpoint, for some reason this this really stuck with me. Uh, it was three weeks of my first trip to Ukraine in March. This girl was asking her mom if the Russians are gonna drop bombs from the sky uh, wherever they're heading, and it was just kind of overwhelmed me. And I just, I took that picture and I just turned around and I just I just bowled and whipped for for a few minutes. So I was born in Kharkiv, moved to the States when I was about 22. Started working in documentary photography first, and then moved on to more portrait-based work. Recently, I've been kind of re-exploring myself in the, in the documentary work again. So Ukraine obviously been very important for me personally. I knew from the beginning of the war, uh, far before the war started. Actually, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna need to be here and cover it. First time I went to Kharkiv, it was in May extremely difficult to kind of tune myself in. Even though it's your country, there's a different story about your own city, the city where you grew up or the city where you walked the streets as a kid. You've seen so many of these images where you just can see the kind of intimate settings of apartments, but the, like the front of the building is missing and um, the indoors seem to be untouched where it seems just like people were just having tea and then this happened. You can see everything. You can see pictures on the walls. You can see cups of cups on the you know, on the shelves, bathrooms. Everything is just it's just here. I tried to prepare myself, but even that wasn't enough. Just to see in what desperate state uh, Kharkiv is. The bombing is just a daily occurrence there. Uh, the city is destroyed beyond recognition. Quite a strange feeling. And you know this kind of this kind of amazed me. Just complete destruction around. All the windows are out, but these folks are just painting their uh, little. <laughs> um, this was a business owner um, of uh, interior design firm. She just came back, and we were doing the story, so we walked in, and she came back basically to start rebuilding her business. So she was just kind of like cleaning out the debris. People just cooking food out on the street because there's no electricity or water. Mm, and you know, the phenomenon of that is um, people, they just refuse to move from their apartments, even though it's the evacuation from those neighbors that have happened a long time ago, they still come back there um, and they insist on in living there. Oh, this woman was, it's from the same, from the same party. Um, this woman just found kind of like a useful um, piece of uh, kitchenware and in a rubble from from a destroyed apartment nearby, from a destroyed apartment house nearby, and she was just carrying it back to that little kitchen that they have. You know, I did a couple of stories in Herston because after the liberation, of course, this was the main story, and a lot of journalists came there, myself included. I was there on the fourth day from liberation, so, um, when I came in, the atmosphere was still very high, but it, from what I hear, it can be compared to what it was on the first day, where people were just like absolutely beyond belief that it actually happened. The whole atmosphere just kind of reminded me of, like if you're sick with a disease and you, you think you can't recover, and then one day you kind of wake up and you get up and you can't believe your legs are walking and you're walking around your apartment and like you don't know who to hug. You're just like, you're so excited you're alive and you, you just have this freedom that you thought you lost. And of course, any, anybody in a, like any sort of military uniform was just, you know, superstar. Kids were running to them and uh, asking to sign a flag. I've never felt anything like that before. 
Of course, that feeling starts to dissipate slowly. Uh, the shelling started intensifying. Uh, so the Russians started bombing Kherson quite intensely and as you know in the last few days has been increasing rapidly, a lot of civilian deaths. One of the biggest tragedies of, um, of liberated areas is the, uh, when, when, when the Russians are retreating they are mostly leaving uh, a lot of landmines. And they're everywhere. It's really no telling where they can be or can be. So it's it's a, just a great danger for civilians to basically go anywhere uh, if the if the land was occupied. Yeah, that's another story about the animals. Like it's, it's European shelters are now overflown with uh, Ukrainian animals, overflown in. Their terms is just, they might not have a free uh, kennel to carry. And overflown in Ukrainian terms means like, people are bringing animals from her zone, like in hundreds or from recently deoccupied areas. And they, like, they have not just a kennel, they have no space to just to put them. And, but they're finding space and they're doing something. This was a couple in Bucha. They were, they left for Western Ukraine when the war started. And when they came back, they found their apartment um, shelled probably from a tank. So it came, the shell came through the balcony, through, through the windows, through their bedroom. There's a bathroom here too. It went through the bathroom. You can see like it went here. <laughs> they were like, you know what? I didn't like the tiles in the bathroom anyway. We're gonna just repair it. I actually really love this picture for some reason. And I just, I, for, for whatever reason, I just like the, just the, the kind of like the diversity of their faces and, and looks, you know? Because they none of them look like soldiers, right? They all look like, you know, a guy who can just like come to, to a party or serve you a drink at a bar or I don't know. Today I read an article in the Times and like some NATO, some NATO executives calling Ukrainian army a MacGyver army, basically kind of like an army that's put together with, you know, glue and shit. It's just amazing um, from all these folks from all walks of life coming in and serving. On one hand, I have to I have to kind of maintain uh, professionalism and also build a story in my head and basically take the most atrocious, horrible things that are people saying to me as to as a material for me to basically do my work. Uh, on another hand, of course, you're listening to the words and you're looking in people's eyes and you see the pain in their eyes and you cry with them and you hold their hands and and you try to be sympathetic but at the same time, you can't waste all your energy. It's a very strange combination of things that you kind of like have to maintain to level off uh, your sanity, your ability to do work, uh, and just ability to fall asleep at night and wake up the next morning and continue work.